Victor Herbert's operetta Babes in Toyland became an instant hit when it opened on Broadway in 1903. Although it ran for 192 performances, it hasn't been revived much in recent years. In fact, the last major New York production was more than 85 years ago. But a new concert version will be presented a week from today on April 27th at Carnegie Hall for one night only. Mm -hmm. It features the 130 singers of the Master Voices Choir and the Orchestra of St. Luke's, conducted and directed by Ted Sperling, the artistic director of Master Voices. It it also has a star-studded cast headed by Kelly O'Hara and Bill Irwin. And I am delighted to welcome Ted Sperling, Kelly O'Hara, and Bill Irwin to this live broadcast from WNYC's Green Space. Thank you. Ted, wasn't Master Voices originally the Collegiate Chorale? Yes, we are celebrating our 75th anniversary season. So why change the name? We had a lot of confusion around the name, the Collegiate Chorale. People thought either we were a college group. There's a story actually about our being hired to perform in a movie with Barbara Streisand, and when the group showed up, they were shocked because they expected (laughs) all kids. And we're a large group of people from all ages and all walks of life. And we decided that our name needed to reflect what we're doing right now, which is telling stories through music. And we wanted to feature singing still as our main mission, but we wanted to expand it to include the voices of our soloists, like Kelly and Bill, the voices of the composers and lyricists that we perform, the voices of our orchestra even, so that we wanted to expand the meaning of our title. Beyond, you've done an incredible amount of stuff in the past. The Mikado, Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado, Brahms Requiem, Mahler's Eighth Symphony. Philip Glass's Koyanis Quatsi. So um, this is a departure in a way. Um, now, does a concert version of Babes in Toyland work better than the full theatrical production yeah. in this age? <laughs> well, to mount a full production of Babes in Toyland in the 1903 style would cost probably $50 million. Oh. Now, it had extravagant scenic effects. It had erupting volcanoes, shipwrecks, um, a scene full of human butterflies. And a shocking plot. Yes, it's a quite an interesting <laughs> twisted plot. Um, we've streamlined it for our purposes. It was originally a three act, uh, four and a half hour show. We've gotten it down to a more normal length with just one intermission. And we've also just you know, made sure that it's actually funny um, <laughs> while preserving, we'll get to that. preserving all the beautiful music. Kelly, didn't you and Ted work together on The King and I and South Pacific and The Light in the Piazza? Among other, many others, oh. yes. yes. So if he calls, you just say, <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> okay, whatever you want? If he calls, I say absolutely, yes. Had you known much about Babes in Toyland before he called this time? No, only the, the title song. Um, you know, and I'd heard about the movie, the Annette, Annette Fincello, you know, that, that whole thing when I was growing up. And I don't, I don't think I ever watched it. But, um, you know, Ted has these ideas that are so creative and brilliant. And, and also, they're a departure from what I usually do, um, especially with things like the Mikado or um, Dido. Dido and Aeneas, which we did last year. So you've done other performances of this sort. I think this is my third or with massive voice. Third or fourth. Yeah, no, it's just uh, it's a wonderful fourth. opportunity. It's my fourth to to get to come in and do something very different, and and of course to work with Ted and all these wonderful people. So I usually uh, I'll I'll say yes every single time I can. What about you, Bill? Uh, is this your first time performing with the group? It is, but when Maestro Sperling calls to examine the history of the American musical, yeah, like Kelly says, you say yes because there is. There are some of us who are carrying the flag for low comedy within the tradition. Uh, <laughs> well, I've known you for both low comedy and serious drama. Uh, I shall be called upon for both in this, Leonard, because uh-huh. the role of the toy maker whom I play has really interesting 1903 roots about which I can say no more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you sing in this? No. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering about that, whether you had any background in singing. Uh, Victor Herbert isn't as much of a household name today, although people may know some of his songs. Um, but he was, was he a really big star? At the he was the, the biggest music star of the time. He was a virtuoso cellist. He was a virtuoso conductor. He was the conductor of the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. He played in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. And he was the most popular songwriter at the time. And there have been several... Uh, film versions of this, including one by Laurel and Hardy. But everybody takes major liberties with it? They do. It's remarkable how many different versions there are of this show. 
and they're wildly different from each other. And so uh, you, you said that uh, because the original Broadway show had huge cast, spectacular sets, a concert format is the only way you'd be able to present it these days? Not necessarily. I mean, there are certainly there are one hour versions meant for children that can still be performed. But to give a sense of what it must have felt like in 1903, which is our aim, I think a concert version is a really smart way to go. The story is based loosely on Mother Goose rhymes with a framing story of a brother and sister who get lost in the woods. Any connection to the Sunheim Lapine into the woods? Well, we've been saying it's a precursor in its own way. It's about two made-up characters, Alan and Jane, who are siblings, who do get uh, lost in the woods and find themselves with all these Mother Goose characters. So, but it's rather dark. <laughs> yes. It's, that's, in a way, what attracted me to the piece, in addition to the beautiful music. I, th I was very surprised when I read the original script at how dark it was and how varied it was. It pulls from all sorts of sources, melodrama, gothic horror, vaudeville, burlesque, um, operetta, romance, and uh, it's, it's a wild amalgam of all those things. Their miserly Uncle Barnaby tries to kill them for their inheritance. He's a banker. This sounds very relevant. <laughs> <laughs> the kind who charges outrageous interest rates and enjoys throwing orphans and widows out into the street. That's right. Um, and he hires two hitmen to do it. What, what's their plan? Well, he hires two hapless ass assistants, basically, sort of a Mutt and Jeff uh, duo, to do the dirty work for him, and they fail every time. Was this considered family-friendly entertainment in 1903? <laughs> you know, it's a very good question, and I don't know the answer. I do know that there was a certain titillation to the original production, because a lot of the men's roles were played by women, which allowed them to wear tights and oh. very, very short shorts or skirts. And it, so it was a chance to see a woman's legs in a period when that really wasn't so common. Is that the kind of costume you're wearing, Kelly? You're playing <laughs> Contrary Mary? Is oh, in... Leonard. Um, no, I'm, no I, Contrary Mary, I, I, I have a nice, I think we're, it's a combination of a, a co stage concert and the show, so a nice cocktail dress that looks maybe gardenish or something. And the, she's Mary Mary Quite Contrary? Yes, I'm Mary Mary Quite Contrary, but I think one of the, the most fun things about this is that they each kind of uh, have a, a lot of aliases. They have a lot of different things they get to do because they're constantly hiding out or trying to be someone else. And it's Shakespearean in that way, you know, oh, all of a sudden I'm a French dressmaker and oh, but now I'm Beatrice Fairfax, you know, and I'm, I'm a love counselor. And so um, there's lots of different things I get to do, but uh, I only get one costume this now, time. Now, Beatrice Fairfax was... Uh, a play on the name of a famous columnist named Beatrice Fairfax. Yes, yes, which I know well from singing, you know, but not for me for a year of my life. Uh, and I remember researching what that was. And so the Beatrice Fairfax of this is kind of a funny connection. And then there were also Jack and Jill, Tom, Tom, the Piper's son, Little Bo Peep. They're all characters in this. Correct. Uh, Bill, you play Master Toymaker. What kind of man is he? He's lovable. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and well, the, as Ted says, this is a look at 1903 in our national consciousness at the time and what audiences enjoyed, what kind of uh, revelations and story twists. And there are many within Ted's compressed two-hour version. There are many. We were rehearsing today, and there's a, a little sequence that's literally called Melodramatic Music. That's the name <laughs> of the piece. And it's, and it's for that moment, is to make a section of the script feel melodramatic. Now, how much rehearsal goes into putting on a one-shot performance? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what people can accomplish in a short time when they have to. So we rehearse well, for around Well, when they're a, professional. That's true. Uh, we rehearse for around a week um, in a rehearsal room, and then we get together with the orchestra for the last couple of days and put it all together just at the last minute. It's really about entrances and exits, but other than that, we're, you know, we're going to do the best we can, but we don't have a lot of time. We're, going to, we're talking about Bo Babes in Toyland, which will be performed for one night only at Carnegie Hall a week from today. And uh, it, the uh, performance is conducted by artistic director of Master Voices, Ted Sperling, and stars, among others, Kelly O'Hara and Bill Irwin. They are with us in the green space today. We're doing a live show, the Leonard Lopez show, live before a wonderful audience. Um, so tell us a bit more about Master Toyland. Is he on the side of Alan and Jane or Uncle Barnaby? The Master Toymaker? Yeah, your character. Well, as I say, there are certain things I cannot uh, reveal. <laughs> it, it's a really, 
I go back to this again. It's a really interesting well, look. Well, he at hates 19- children. He makes toys. He hates children. Can I say that? I'd rather you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> It, you know, it's a challenge. There are some straight-ahead, uh, low-comedy moments, which the maestro is turning over to some of us. The two, the two assassins you mentioned earlier, Leonard, are played by Chris Sullivan and Jeffrey Schechter, whom just, they just go by the name Sully and Shecky. So it gives you a sense of how we're looking at uh, yeah. American comedy and its history. But I get to play this role that calls upon me as a pantomimic, baggy-pants comedian, and also... Uh, an actor to reveal another side of this character. And I was hoping that Bill would play this from the very beginning, partially because of his Shakespearean background as well. I feel like Shakespeare actually plays a role in a lot of the characters in this yeah. piece. There's even, you know, Exit Pursued by a Bear is actually part of our show as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, he, Shakespeare loved clowns. Yes. He put clowns in a number of his yeah. uh, plays, and including some of the very serious ones. Because yeah, in this case, we would assume that this is a happy-go-lucky thing. It turns out to be rather dark. In Shakespeare, often we assume the thing is going to be dark, and there's these funny moments. There are actually two deaths in our production. Ah. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not going to go into the kinds of toys that your character makes. Mm-hmm. Un- gives them to, on Christmas? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yes. I- I'm ho- the character hopes that he may be able to create in a toy even a soul. It's an aspiration that, and again, I sort of say no more. I'm fascinated by that, too. What was current in 1903, there's this idea of dolls that do things on their own, which, of course, now they do. <laughs> yeah. And there's even a song about the health food fad in 1903, and it could have been written today. A health food fad uh, because uh, it's, what, it's about grain or something? Eat a heap of buckawita. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's how Barnaby plans to pay his assassin villain uh, sidekicks with stock in the Eat a Heap of Buckawita company. It should be called these days Eat a Heap of Gluten Frida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants wheat anymore. Didn't parents object to some of the aspects of this story? It might have given their children nightmares. My kids love things that are scary. When we watch the Wizard of Oz movie, they just want to see the scenes with the Wicked Witch and skip through the rest. So yeah. I think, you know, their fairy tales have always been scary. And I think there are kids who have nightmares afterwards, but that's part of growing up. You mentioned there's that commercial for Eat a Heap, Heap a Buck a Weed a Company, but there are some pretty famous songs from oh, the show yes, as well. Oh, yes, there are. Well, you already heard as we were intro to the March of the Wooden Soldiers probably the most famous, and I was just at Radio City Music Hall last night and saw the costumes for the wooden soldiers ah. that the Rockettes do, and that's to that music. Um, oh, Toyland is, is yeah, big. Toyland. Toyland. Toy right, that's another very famous one. And it's funny, friends of ours have been saying, oh, you're doing Babes in Toyland? This is my favorite song. Like, I can't do the sum. Or, you know, other mm-hmm. songs that you would think, how do you know that? And yeah. it has somehow seeped into the general consciousness. But you've also rewritten some of the songs. Don't you even include a reference to Donald Trump in the Oh, world? you're giving everything away, Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was one song that we really wanted to include. It, you want to make this sound more boring? No. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, that um, was clearly written to have three verses, because there's different music for each of the verses. But the lyric only exists for the first. So we needed to write a second and third lyric, which our scriptwriter Joe Keenan has done brilliantly. And it was my idea that, you know, let's step out of that time period for just one verse and have a little fun. Mm-hmm. You also have a chorus of 130 people, yes. a full orchestra. Yes. And we should mention some of the other members of the cast. Blair Please. Brown. Blair, Blair Brown. Brown Chris, the dry Chris voice. Fitzgerald. Christopher Fitzgerald. Yes, Lauren Warsham. J. Armstrong Johnson. Jonathan Freeman. Yes, and Michael Kostroff. It's an amazing group. I'm so happy. Chris that Sullivan. Chris Jeffrey Sullivan Schechter. and Schechter. Is it easier to assemble an all-star cast of this sort because you're doing it for one night only, even though there is all of that rehearsal time required? I think it does help. We're not asking somebody for a six-month commitment. Yes. Plus, when are we on stage with the, the huge orchestra, the huge chorus? You know, uh, it's, that's a magical moment for me, so I try to do that every chance I get. And then you can do other stuff in your life. Bill, aren't you also involved with... The, uh, the movement to close Rikers Island? Well, here in the green space, my family and I heard speakers out of the hearing of which we have uh, become part of that movement. And Monday's our day off, you know, thanks to our union. We, uh, the maestro couldn't call us for rehearsal, even if he wanted to. So everybody attends to life and family. There's still unions? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> in the theater, there are. 
Yeah, so in the in the morning, I'll be part of uh, down on the city hall steps the rally to continue the move to close Rikers, hearing galvanizing speakers, Glenn Martin, whom I heard here on this stage, and other people. Then in the afternoon and the evening, race uptown to be part of Jacques Dembois' National Dance Institute uh, fundraiser. That's life in New York, this this yeah. wild and beautiful city. Mm-hmm. And this is the way that performers these days fill their time between the big jobs? <laughs> <laughs> well, Kelly does it even when she has a big job. She is the gala uh, queen. Well, and, there are causes that are important. <laughs> and Kelly, what do you have in store past next Thursday? Well, like he says, I'm, I'm doing several galas, uh, one for the New York Pops, one for playwrights, one for say.org, which is a stuttering association for the youth, which I'm very passionate about. Um, and then I'm gearing up for couple of things in the fall Brigadoon, and then I'm doing going back to the Met, uh, Cozy Fan Tutte, and then uh, mm. I'll see what comes next. That sounds impressive. So you know what you're about, what you're going to be doing for the next year or so, at least. Yeah, for right now. You know, in opera, what's unusual is, you know, within four, you know, four years ahead. So mm-hmm. um, that feels nice. Yeah. And but, Ted, uh, after Babes in Toyland, the, one of the, this monumental job, yes. where do you go from there? Um, I also have some concerts with symphony orchestras um, over the summer, and we're busy uh, planning next season for Master Voices. <clears throat> Excuse me, we have exciting things in store. We have three big programs, possibly four, including an opera, another musical in concert, um, and a, a brand new cantata written for us. And then it looks like I'm going to be conducting the Lincoln Center production of My Fair Lady in the spring. Ooh, wow. Wow. But uh, in, in something like this, do you go back to the original score? Can you just play the original score? Or do you have to adjust it to modern instruments and modern sensibility of how music should sound? For Babes in Toyland, I'm very much trying to recreate the sound of 1903. So we're using the original orchestrations, the original size of the orchestra. And I have the help of some wonderful musician scholars who have been preparing that for us. Mm-hmm. And I assume that you're finding this a lot of fun. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Terror filled. <laughs> well, why is it terror filled? But fun. Uh, do you you don't rem- have to memorize your lines, do you? It's one night only on the great Carnegie Hall stage, and uh, one hopes to do, you know, one's colleagues proud. It's it's filled with terror, but really exciting. No, we'll have we'll have stands and 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 books and uh, and things, but we'll we'll do the best we can. They're always amazing at improvising, and sometimes when people make a mistake on stage, that's the most fun moment yeah. of the whole evening. I've also given Bill a really big challenge because there's a number. <laughs> that establishes the Toymaker's Workshop, and it's filled with the sounds of the toys. But we don't have any set, and we don't have any props. So Bill has to create all of that for us with his body and his face. And so he's working very hard on that right now. Before you go, I should mention some of the things that you've won over the years. Kelly O'Hara has won a Tony Award for Best Performance by an Actress in a Leading Role in a Musical for The King and I, nominated for the Bridges of Madison County. Nice work if you can get it, the Pajama Game South Pacific and the Light in the Piazza, and I would have given you those awards as well. <laughs> I appreciate that. Bill Irwin <laughs> won a Best Actor Tony for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? One of the most, I think you were the best George I've ever yeah. seen. You know, definitely. It's a great play. Nominated for Largely in New York, and Ted Sperling won a Tony for The Light in the Piazza. And you can... I'm sure there's still a few tickets available. For yes, not many, especially the good seats. So please don't wait. Buy your tickets now. And you can find more information about that on our show page at wnyc.org slash lopate. My great thanks to Ted Sperling, Kelly O'Hara, and Bill Irwin for joining us today to talk about Babes in Toyland. Thank you, Leonard. On today's live Come broadcast from the Green Space. Thanks Thank for having you, us, Leonard. Thank you. The Master Voices program, <clears throat> excuse me, a boys in to- Babes in Toyland will appear at the Stern Auditorium at Carnegie Hall, April 27th at 7 p.m. Coming up next, Anthony Bourdain and Lydia Tenaglia, who made a documentary about Jeremiah Tower, will be joined by the legendary Mr. Tower, the chef who's recognized as the godfather of modern American cooking. We are broadcasting live from the green space on WMIC, WMIC.org. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. My handle is at Leonard Lopate. <laughs>